Our second reading of the morning, in essence, celebrates the circle of life. The two candles I lit in silence were in gratitude for the lives of my dear friends, Rob and Jan Eller Isaacs, who served the Unitarian Church in Oakland, California for 14 years, and then Unity Church Unitarian in St. Paul, Minnesota for another 22. Rob and then Jan both died in the last 18 months. Rob had the discipline of getting up before dawn every morning to greet the sunrise, to do Tai Chi and memorize a poem. And this poem was written by our colleague Reverend Jen Crow, minister of First Universalist in Minneapolis, who led family and friends in scattering Rob's ashes on the headwaters of the Mississippi. For Rob. Early morning rising, body aching, ever moving, still. Out you'd go to greet the day, out to the woods and beach, the trees you'd go, past blackberry brambles, through burrs in their coats and sun-dappled pathways with sandy feet. Out you'd go to the light, the water, the rain, the sky. You walked it out, worked it out, prayed it out. You let us here, left us here, in the woods and the wonder of this life, this day, this grief. Where do we find you now? I wonder out loud, and out of you, you say in my mind, out you go, moving towards stillness, out of yourself, out of your mind, out of your comfort zone, out of your depth, get out of yourself, get out. Find the water the way, the walk. Find the challenge so hard you are sure you will fail. Find me in the wind, in the work, in the walk in the woods, here in the wonder, here in the beauty, here in the breathtaking, heart aching, unspeakable pain, here in the challenge of life, here in the transformation of who we are, to who we could be still. You showed us the way and left us to it. This transformation, this love, this life. A gift offered and received. You led us here, left us here, here in the in-between. You are here and here and here. The stuff of stardust and miracle, and moments transient and permanent. You are here, still here. Please join now in one of the most beloved of Unitarian Universalist hymns, Spirit of Life. Remain seated.
I don't know about bodily resurrection. I've never seen one. I leave explaining such things to others. But resurrections of the Spirit, those I can testify to. Because I, like you, have known grief. On Easter Sunday in 1982, members of the First Unitarian Church in Oakland did what you did last week. They held a town meeting or congregational meeting. The number present in voting was barely greater than the 12 disciples. The area around their historic church in downtown Oakland was in such decline that it felt frankly a little dangerous. They'd once attempted to sell the building, but nobody wanted to buy. And their minister, Dr. Arnold Crompton, who had been with them since Easter of 1945, was already past retirement age, facing open heart surgery, and had announced that he'd be leaving as of August. The meeting was to decide whether to accept a young minister named Rob Isaacs, recommended by the UUA, in the role of urban extension minister, charged with bringing the church back from the brink of, well, extinction. Rob had grown up in Unitarian Universalism and was profoundly influenced by the interracial Chicago Children's Choir at First Unitarian in that city. And at his heart were music and worship and human connection. He poured that into his door-to-door, -door, person to person effort at spiritual renewal for the congregation. And within five years, that congregation had not only a groundbreaking program of worship associates, but a 48 voice choir. And so many members that Rob's wife, Jan, who had just finished seminary, was called to serve with him as co-minister. Now, in case you don't know it, David Dodd and Diana were all part of that. David. And that spirit is not just in St. Paul or in Oakland. In no small part, it's right here. Rob and Jen and I became lifelong friends when they volunteered, to my amazement, to co-direct my successful campaign to become UUA president. I loved Jan's bluntness when she heard a wrong note from me, or how Rob grounded his own savvy in that morning spiritual discipline, getting up each day to welcome whatever the day might bring. One Sunday, I brought the UUA President's Council, the major donors of the denomination, to the Oakland Church to see what a little denominational investment in urban extension could bring about. By that time, Rob and Jen had partnered with the city to make the church a facility helping, helping to rehouse homeless families. In the process, they raised $7 million to renovate the building. It goes back to the 1880s. There were often well over 300 people at worship. But after 14 years, they felt they'd done all they could. The congregation was thriving. And in 1999, they accepted a call to another urban church in St. Paul. Well, the last time I preached for them there, there were 800 people at worship, four services, one on Saturday, followed by a church supper, two on Sunday morning, one on Sunday afternoon before another 
meal pri aimed primarily at young adults and college students. Along the way, Rob had become president of the Unitarian Universalist Ministers Association. And he turned what had frankly been a rather grouchy group of clergy, leading themselves as volunteers, into a well-staffed hub of spiritual renewal, continuing education, and the cultivation of professional excellence. As a trustee of the denomination, he shocked one of my successors as president by persuading the board at one meeting to raise $5 million for Black Lives UU, repairing a broken promise from the late 1960s. They had no sooner retired from St. Paul and moved to Portland, Oregon, where their three adult children and a few grandchildren had settled when Rob got the diagnosis of incurable cancer. And I flew up to spend a couple of days with him in conversation about all that his life had meant to me and to so many others. To my frustration, his memorial services, one there in Portland and one in St. Paul, were held when I was off with my dear wife celebrating our 50th wedding anniversary. And then, not too long after that, Jan, too, was diagnosed with a different form of cancer and fought it nobly, but succumbed, appropriately enough, on Valentine's Day this year. Now, I hope you'll forgive me if this sermon sounds like a memorial service for them. It is. But then, in conventional churches, every Sunday is sort of a memorial service for Jesus, right? <laughs> Some aspect of his life. One of our affirmations as Unitarian Universalists is that the spirit didn't confine itself to a single human embodiment. The spirit, the spirit of wholeness and love and justice can inhabit many bodies and has. And these two not only had the spirit, they knew how to bring it back in others. There's a passage in that great novel by Boris Pasternak, Dr. Zhivago, that comes to mind. Zhivago is tending to a woman whose cancer he knows she can't, he can't cure. And he becomes far less her physician and more and more her pastor or priest saying, your spirit will live on, you know. Your spirit is you and others others in you. Another Unitarian Universalist minister who was a mentor to me wrote of that passage, we enter into the being and lives of others as they do into ours, sometimes momentarily, sometimes enduringly. This is what love essentially is, to be part of one another in simple sympathy, in close friendship, in shared perceptions, in sorrow, and in joy. Love is when persons exist for us with such intensity and such density that our lives are transformed because of what they are and how they speak to us from the depths of their mystery as we do to them. Love does not desire to possess, but to share to give, to communicate, to pass on. Recently, as Christine knows, I, I finished teaching an online Lenten course for UUs in the Bay Area called Love and Death, a reintroduction to the Christian scriptures for skeptics, seekers, and religious liberals. During the session called Resurrections, I noted that the four gospel accounts not only are hardly consistent, 
Now, their points are mutually contradictory, but that in the oldest one, the one we heard earlier, the one about the women going to the empty tomb, there's nothing said about the body. It's about the spirit. Speculations of what, what became of the body, whether it was stolen in some sort of Passover plot and a miracle then could be proclaimed. But those speculations don't much interest me. But like most biblical scholars, I suspect that it was the friends grieving who interpreted his death as having happened according to the scriptures. Thinking mostly of the Psalms and Isaiah's songs about the suffering servant. And I think they also probably ran away, scattered. What well, at least one we know denied ever knowing him. But back in Galilee and in around Jerusalem, I'm sure some had some very vivid experiences that he was still in their midst, wherever two or three gathered. It also occurs to me that those who had loved Jesus probably didn't have those experiences or really received his spirit until they had fully grieved their deep loss. Because grief takes time. Surely more than three days. I'm reminded of an experience in my own family. When Gwen and I had been married just three years, her mother had an accident. She lived in Oakland. She went out to fetch the morning paper and tripped and landed on the back of her head. We were then living in Tennessee where I was a young, poorly paid, new pastor. Gwen flew out to her mother quickly with our newborn daughter in her arms, but I couldn't afford to go with her. And when it became clear that my mother-in-law's body had survived, but not her spirit or her mind. And two neurologists confirmed this. I had to go out and support Gwen, who was wrestling with her uncle about whether to take her mother off the respirator. Someone in my church anonymously gave the $500 I needed to join her. And I ended up arguing with that uncle, a techie, who was just certain modern science could bring her back. He wanted to fly her to the Mayo Clinic near his home in Minnesota. I argued with him about which of us was trying to play God. Call it no faith in bodily resurrection, if you will. But to this day, I defend it, the kindest thing we could do, letting her go. But then when the funeral came, it was still Eastertide at St. Paul's Church in Oakland, where both Gwen's parents had been in the church leadership and where we were married. Chancel was decorated with butterflies as symbols of resurrection. The service from the Book of Common Prayer was all full of pious assertions about Jesus being the resurrection and the life. And all I can say is that Gwen and I both sat there thinking, nothing's risen just now. We're still grieving. Recently, as I reread those resurrection stories in the Bible, it struck me that even when Jesus is said to have raised his friend Lazarus from the dead, that didn't occur until after the shortest verse in the whole of the scriptures, Jesus wept. I think it was designed to be short so we'd notice it. But that's how the spirit rises from grief. There's a Buddhist story that comes to mind about Kisa Gatami, who has the dreadful experience of her newborn child 
suddenly dying. And she clutches his lifeless body. It's not unlike those images of Jesus in the arms of his mother Mary, as in the Pietà in the Vatican. But in the Gospel story, Mary's grief is at least softened by knowing that he, her son had died for something bigger than himself, maybe for challenging the Roman imperialism, for speaking out and trying to realize right here now what tradition called the kingdom, which Dr. King so ably translated as the beloved community, in which all people across all differences of faith and race and social location would treat one another as sisters and brothers, children of the one unseen source of being. Kissa, on the other hand, only knew that her much younger child had died for no good reason. And the day after that, according to the story, the child's father died. She was beside herself. She let her in-laws bury the husband, but she would not let go of that dead child. And rushing about, seeking someone to bring the baby back to life. Finally, she was sent to the Buddha, who was passing through and who was said to have remarkable spiritual powers. Please, master, she cried, bring my son back to life. I'm ready to give my own life. We'll do that. And the Buddha simply looked at her in profound compassion and said, I can do that. Bring him back to life for you. But for me to do so, you must bring me mustard seed from a house somewhere where no one has ever died. Kissa ran frantically from household to household, the dead child still in her arms. Please show me a family that has never experienced death. But no one could. And finally, exhausted, she returned to the Buddha, who asked, where are the mustard seeds? Almost hysterical, but also somehow enlightened. She laughed. Everyone dies. The Buddha then took the body of the baby from her to be buried, saying, now you are awake. Like Rob, like Jan, I try to awake every morning to the awareness of my own mortality, and to the preciousness of the day that lies ahead. Knowing that it's the true miracle that I face, the dual mystery of being alive now and knowing that indeed everyone must die. This, I believe, is the basis of all authentic religion, of whatever creed or type. And every morning I pray for a resurrection of the spirit within me so that I can help revive it somehow in others. May the spirit that was in Robin Jeb and in so many faithful spirits who lived for the sake of greater wisdom and greater compassion now be in this place as well. May this house we seek to renovate contain a spirit that goes out from here and transforms many lives and makes beloved community, not only within, but beyond these walls. And may the flame of faith that symbolizes what we try to do here then go forth into the lives and the commitment and the transformation of a world that desperately needs our witness for human dignity, for peaceful ways of being, and for greater justice for all. So may it be. Amen.